invent a course. And I've written a couple books in the last decade, but there was one area of life that was very troubling to me. It was unsettled. Looking at entrepreneurship, I noticed that some cities seemed to be totally loaded with entrepreneurs, and others had entrepreneurial deficit. And I kept wondering whether or not this was related to whether or not cities had great, be beautiful futures ahead of them, or whether or not they were going to fail into the future. So I established a course on failed cities, fast cities, and lo and behold, it got posted and people signed up for it. And the night before it started, I hadn't taught in several decades. I was as nervous as could be. I didn't know how to start the course. And then I remembered, it was like a lightning bolt from heaven, that as a high school debater, I had once been in the Maxwell School. And on the wall of the Maxwell School was this extraordinary oath that the citizens of Athens took to the city. It had embodied the notion of what old time cities were about. It said we will revere and obey the city's law and we will transmit the city, not, not less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. Right here on the wall of the Maxwell School, the first school of citizenship, we now call it government in the United States, and it's founded at the time when cities are the real locus of government. It really is a city school. Now also, we think about a city, a guidance to the city from the Greeks. It comes to us from Plato and Aristotle, who keep telling us that cities are places where people should flourish. And in fact, in the early years of America, certainly 1924, 28, when the Maxwell School was opened, the notion of a non-great city in America, our cities were all beautiful. They were going to grow for thousands of years. We were creating the new Europe, and people came here. We had a beautiful cities movement. In fact, enshrined in one of our great hymns, America the Beautiful, we speak about thine alabaster cities gleam. And then the undeniable wrong future happened for places like Detroit. So my students and I were off to the races. Thank goodness I got to that inspirational beginning. And the way to treat this, I thought, was to look at fast cities and failed cities and do a dialectic analysis. And this is where it becomes uncomfortable because none of us like to think about things in America that really don't work. And none of us like to think about perhaps the city we grew up in not being the beautiful alabaster shining city into the future. My students and I began to develop some data. And these data may be disturbing. What this tells us is we have 13 cities that we call failed. That is, it's very hard to see them coming back. When they've lost, in aggregate, half of their population in just a few decades, one wonders if they can have an economy. If you don't have people, you don't have an economy, a robust economy. And by contrary, we see these 10 fast cities, which have doubled in size in just the last couple of decades, so we have cities that are flourishing. They're growing like crazy. And revealing really the economic essence of this argument, when we see the production of these cities in terms of their economy, we see that the fast cities are growing like crazy in terms of their economy. And the slower cities, and these just aren't cities, so this is a very important point. These data are for the cities and their suburbs. So sometimes we want to leap to the conclusion that if we just wrap up the suburbs into our failing cities, all will go well. The reality is, when the core melts down, even the suburbs grow slowly. Really important. So then, we began to look at really a fundamental change in the civics of cities, and in the politics of cities. Around 1975, there begins a disproportionate shift of federal aid into these cities. Now, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who used to teach here, he was on the faculty at Maxwell, and he spent his last years here as a university professor, once said about these transfer payments that they diminish and demean the people who take the money, and they corrupt the people who give the money. And this is a very troubling statistic or chart, because one of the things it suggests to us is maybe this transfer is not going to go on forever. Maybe this is not sustainable. And it pushes us further to ask this question of what we do about our failed cities. If you take a look at how fast they don't grow, their last dates on average of annexation were 1921. And our 10 fast cities are still annexing land. 
And here's the real kickaroo. People really move. And it actually asks us a question about American history itself. We are a very, very mobile population and always have been. And perhaps in the days when we were thinking about every city is stable and growing like crazy, we should have thought maybe that can't last. So they're going to places in the sun for the most part and with low taxes. And as we probed this, we began to think about the causes of city failure. Up there are the technology causes. And the technology causes all begin really around 1959 when the cities start to lose population. 1959 is the year when the jet plane was introduced, making transportation cheap. 1959 is when long distance began to fall in terms of proportion of a family income. It became cheap to communicate. 1959 is when the federal highways, the interstate highway system is built. 1959 is when the forward look is building cars that look like spaceships. Put aside the aesthetics, they go fast, huge horsepower. We can go places. And America is knitting itself in ways that permit us to think we don't lose our friends when they go to the University of Oregon. We Skype them. It's free. They didn't go off into Never Never Land. America got very quick with communications and technology. Another cause of federal of failure is the federal policy itself that was intended to improve cities. And essentially it happens in four areas, housing, health care, education, and transportation. Let's just take a look at a couple of these issues. We begin to do slum clearance, and we're going to make our cities beautiful again by taking care of the slums. We're going to build something new for dispossessed people. We didn't think of folks as dispossessed, but by the way, starting in the, in the Depression under President Roosevelt, we start slum clearance. And suddenly, one of the things we did not observe, observe this was the demise of family-owned businesses in minority communities. This is the end of a very vibrant economy. Because when we thought about the solution of putting people in beautiful high-rise buildings, this is in St. Louis, this is Pru Diego, we can't find anywhere around those buildings anything that looks like a place for business. So the city planners who are going to build beautiful new homes forgot beautiful new businesses that they snatched from the people who had owned them. And of course, the solution of smarter people in Washington didn't really work so much. That's the same housing project 10 years later. It so didn't work, we had to cry uncle and take it down. This is federal policy so well intended. It was the beautiful cities of the Model Cities Act, and it collapsed. Likewise, we think about the wonderful business of knitting the society together with the interstate highway, but look what it did to downtown Boston, like it did in many downtowns. It destroyed the civic fabric of downtown, all perfectly well intended. The notion was these cities would have a revitalized economy if they got the interstate, and cities fought for the interstates to be downtown. And when we look back, how smart was this? And likewise, we could find the same problem in education and health care. But this raises a question about more competition. And now, in fact, we have a cycle that makes the cities that are competing actually more competitive. They begin to gather smarter people. They have more jobs. They have higher incomes. They are basically reinventing capital markets. Those old cities, you go to old cities like Cleveland and Buffalo, Buffalo is an exception, Toledo, Rochester, there are no banks owned in the community. All the banking was done someplace else. Suddenly, places like Charlotte are banking capitals. The shifting of all the internets and the inter, excuse me, the, the, the networks of how commerce is done and why people live places and where technology happens, all shifting. Here's a radical shift. Right now, the state of California gets four times on a per capita basis on a per capita basis in its universities, federal research support is the state of New York. How can a state compete against these faster places that are gathering more and more momentum? Now, there are solutions around. Some of you know these solutions. I've tried to build a firewall from the immediate leap you want to make and just say, let's go get the suburbs. Remember H.L. Mencken said, for every problem, there's an easy, quick answer that's wrong. 
Michael Porter 25 years ago told us that all we needed was industrial clusters, new industrial clusters in Cleveland and Rochester, and the city would be revived. It's ahistoric, that view. All of these cities had industrial clusters. Buffalo milled, Rochester made cameras, Syracuse made typewriters, Cleveland was a railroading city, Detroit made cars. We knew these things. They had their own industrial clusters, and the notion of transporting a new one in is very hard to pull off. Richard Florida, as many of you may know, is the guy who says what we have to do is allure this creative class that's out there floating around in space to come to our town. And the way we do that is we build loft housing and arts districts. And suddenly, downtown will be revitalized, and more and more people will see what a cool, hip place this is. There's no evidence that this worked anywhere. And in fact, there's something that's working in this theory that's disturbing. That is to say, through all of history, art follows the creation of wealth. But he suggests that the creation of art will lead to the creation of wealth. It doesn't work, and it hasn't worked. The empirics show it. And lastly, of course, the latest is this notion that somehow if we just incorporate the suburbs into the main cities, well, we'll have all kinds of solutions right in hand. But the reality is, just like the unforeseen circumstances of so much other policy, it's easy to see that if we begin this consolidation, all that will happen is people who have means, people who own businesses, people who are creative about business, will relocate to places like Florida and Texas and Arizona. So what are we to do? Well, here's a solution. And I want to suggest this solution is totally different from those solutions because there's one common denominator in those solutions that should never ring true anywhere in America. That is to say, in my city, we're going to look for people outside to bring the solution. Now think about what I said not long ago. Every city in America was part of the big industrial market net. Ours was a continental economy. We had a railroad that pulled us together. So Rochester made cameras for America. Schenectady made light bulbs for America. Buffalo made wheat for America. Cleveland did its thing. Toledo did its thing. Scales, as we know, Dayton made breaks. Every place had its own industrial core. And it was indigenous. There was no Michael Porter who brought it a vision. The vision of every one of these cities was the vision of entrepreneurs who were indigenous. They came up with these ideas, and they built them there, and they made their cities beautiful and prosperous. They saw to the creation of art museums the evidence that they would be around forever. They wanted these cities to be places where all the citizens flourished. So my answer to this is we actually have to go back to the future. These sort of deus ex machina solutions that experts in fancy schools will bring us the future for any city. And we have to be realistic. First, lots of our cities aren't going to be that big again. But if they're going to prosper, they have to have indigenous businesses. We have to have more entrepreneurship, especially in our failing cities. And to get there, the key to this, I'm going to explain this in my next book, which is called Burn the Business Plan, which will be out from uh, in, 19, in 2015 uh, from uh, 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 Simon & Schuster. We have to have ideas. The core of growth is ideas and the ambition for scale. And where are these ideas coming from? There are two sources. Every city has a diaspora, people who used to live there. That map that showed us they went to Phoenix and to Florida is where great ideas for these cities exist because these people are desperate to help their hometowns, be it Cleveland or Rochester or Utica or Schenectady. And we have no commerce and ideas back and forth. Now, the Indus Entrepreneurship Group, people in America from India, are phenomenally instructive in teaching us how to communicate our ideas from America into India and create a network, a thick network of ideas. We have to develop these diaspora networks abroad. And then secondly, we have to develop the means of new ideas internally, indigenous new ideas. And to do this, we have to rebuild the infrastructures that were so important in these cities 
to the creation of new ideas. Great schools, places to tinker, laboratories, places where people can go tinker in workshops after school. We have to have a vision that this city and all these failed cities can prosper again. The difference from the solutions that come are cities that will be stabilized. The promise me and my students are after is how to make these cities anticipate real growth so everyone can prosper. Thank you.